So before we get started, any questions on anything we've covered so far? So again, this is over neurology, it's over behavioral, it's over immunizations, and HIV slash STD, it's an infectious disease. So just a few drugs for the test, right? I think all, how many of you already know? This is just a small addition to the pile, right? I learned that half those drugs can give you uh, Stephen Johnson. A lot of them can give you Stephen Johnson, as it turns out. Who knew? <laughs> so no questions to begin with. You guys are like, we got this. We're good. We're going to have a 57 or 8-way tie for first. <laughs> Do you want to explain privatism to your grandma? <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> Subaru isn't an STD. That's very true. Thank you. It's an STI. All right, I'm going to go ahead and kick it off so you guys can keep logging in. Hurry quick. If you want the points, we're getting started. <clears throat> I need two questions. Which of the following should be avoided in patients taking phenylzine? A couple of foods here. Is it tilapia, fava beans, roasted turkey, or white wine? What do we think? You may be asking yourself, why did he put this horrifying picture here? I forgot. I'm just kidding. I know why I put that there. <laughs> That is true. Fava beans is the correct answer. Anyone who that was? Hannibal Lecter, right? That was an Oscar award winning movie. Silence of the Lambs. You should all check it out. It's very good. Um, <clears throat> so, why fava beans? Why is that a problem? It has a high amount of tyramine in it, right? So, tyramine, why is that a problem? Hmm? It can cause a hypertensive crisis. Why can it cause a hypertensive crisis? Because what does tyramine eventually turn into? Catecholamines, right? Like norepinephrine, like serotonin, like dopamine. Norepinephrine, that's why it causes a hypertensive crisis, right? It's going to be stimulating your whole sympathetic nervous system like that. So it can lead to serotonin syndrome, can lead to hypertensive crisis, all those things, right? You guys okay back there? Moving around? Are oh, you moving forward? Fantastic. Front row activity. Oh, there you go. Okay, that works. Um, <laughs> what other foods could I put on here that would have been a correct answer? Red wine, beer. hot dogs, beer, aged cheeses, aged meats, all that good stuff, right? The bougie foods is what you kind of think of. That's what I think of. Um, tilapia, not so much. Roasted turkey, not so much. White wine, totally fine, right? Uh, so red wines that tend to be have a higher tyramine content there, right? Okay. Going forward, what's up next? Which of the following would cause lithium levels to rise in a bipolar patient? <coughs> Eating a whole bag of salty potato chips, starting treatment with amlodipine, polydipsia, or dehydration? What do we think? Interesting. So let's work through this. Okay, so first off, why is it not eating a whole bag of potato chips? So if I eat a salty bag of potato chips, my sodium levels go up, what is that going to do to my lithium? If anything, it might drive it down a little bit, right? Because why? what does lithium look like to the kidneys? It looks like sodium. So if you're in a sodium excretory sort of state, you're trying to get rid of sodium, then you're probably going to get rid of lithium too. Right, so that's kind of the big thing to think about. What are going to be things that put me into a salt retentive state? So going along with that polydipsia, is that going to put you into a salt retentive state? Not necessarily, right? 
So you would not see that uh, as a case may be. That would actually, if anything, cause more of a dilutional sort of effect, and so you see the levels go down there. Um, dehydration, absolutely, right? Because again, you want to hold on to salt, which means you hold on to more water, and then lithium is going to stay along with that salt as well, right? So dehydration certainly would have your levels rise in that case, even just by uh, sort of concentrating the blood, the levels are going to go up there. Now, looking at the, the Norvask question here, that tripped up some of you. So Norvask wouldn't really do it, right? Because it's not really changing anything in regards to, say, renal blood flow or anything um, in regards to lithium, how it's handled. So which antihypertensives could affect that, though? You may see that occasionally with thiazides or like a loop diuretic, right? Because again, that puts you into a salt retentive state. So certainly, what else could I put on there? ACE inhibitors, right? ACE inhibitors and ARBs could also be put on there, right? Because they will decrease GFR and they're going to lead to less filtration of the lithium. So I hold on to more of it. Um, what else could I put on there that not for hypertension, say for instance, for pain? For inflammation. NSAIDs would have been on that category too, right? Because again, that would decrease uh, renal perfusion and you'd see lithium levels rise. Very important to consider all these different medication interactions with lithium because it's a very kind of temperamental sort of drug. Uh, even small changes in levels can cause big changes in the mental status for the patient. Um, you know, seizures are a very common thing we see even with iatrogenic sort of overdoses from medications the patients started on and no one bothered to go back through and check their levels. So again, that's why we kind of moved away from lithium. We used a lot more of the anticonvulsants such as what do we use for bipolar disorder? Valproic acid, what else? Carbamazepine, what else? Lamotrigine or lamictal? Yes, sir. Shouldn't really have any effect on the lithium level specifically. Should be lithium neutral in those cases there. Very good. Okay, so, um, right, so again, that's why we're kind of moving away from that. It's still very effective, right? Um, but it's just very temperamental, especially in patients with kind of unstable renal function. Very good. If you guys remind me, I wanted to talk about the case yesterday, so I forgot to start off with that, but if you remind me at the end, I want to talk about the meds and stuff, if you don't mind. So if someone remind me if you think about it. Unless you just want to get out of here really early, then don't remind me, and I'll probably forget about it. <laughs> okay, um, sulfamethoxazole trimethoprim is used to treat which opportunistic infection? Is it for oropharyngeal candidiasis? Is it for cytomegalovirus, PJP pneumonia, or mycobacterium avium complex? What do we think? Last person is going to turn in their answer. Oh, that's the person. <laughs> I'm just going to skip you. You don't want to turn in your answer. Okay, I'm skipping them. Okay. Um, sorry if you did not enter your answer. But, uh, yes, PJP pneumonia, right? That's one of the first things you're going to start your patients on when they have uh, neutropenia, right? Especially like chemotherapy, especially with like HIV, those things. Usually when you're CD4 count, especially for those patients, gets down below 200. That's the first med you're going to start them on for PJP prophylaxis. Um, and again, when you start them on it before they get the disease, what do you call that? Primary prophylaxis, right? Versus secondary prophylaxis, where they may, if you actually get the pneumonia, you'll be treated for that with the treatment dose, and then afterwards you'll be on secondary prophylaxis afterwards. Make sure you don't get it again, essentially. Um, what could I use for the, the thrush? Nice statin's a good one. Why do we like that? It's not systemically absorbed. That's a good one. What else could I use instead? Say it was more invasive, like esophageal. Itraconazole, maybe, but usually people go with. Fluconazole is more common one we end up going with, absolutely. Right? And you got to be careful with your 3A4 in interactions whenever you start to add on uh, your azole antifungals. Because, again, that's how they affect the fungus. By affecting their SIP enzymes, they affect ours as well. Right? Uh, MAC, you actually use um, clothromycin is a common one used for prophylaxis for that one. Okay. Patient receives an inactivated vaccine today. Which of the following are true? If he misses his next appointment, he has to restart the series. He can receive a live vaccine next week. He needs to wait at least six weeks before the next dose. He can only receive other inactivated vaccines today. What do we think?
Very good. He can receive a live vaccine next week. So let's talk about it. Um, so if he misses his next appointment, he has to restart the series. Why is that incorrect? Generally, a little extra time between doses is totally fine. Now, if he says, well, my next appointment, I'm going to schedule out five years from now, eh, maybe you want to restart that series, right? So within reason. But if it was, say, a month, a couple weeks, not a big deal. You can just keep going with the normal series uh, after that. Um, he needs to wait at least six weeks before the next dose. Why is that wrong? At least four. Yeah, four is the, the minimum. You need to, to space those out in those cases, there, right? Um, he can only receive other inactivated vaccines today. You see, yeah, he's received live vaccines. You can get multiple live, multiple inactivated. Any of those two are, are fine on the same day, right? The only issue is when you start to do what? Separate out the live vaccines, right? Because then how long do you need to get between those? Four weeks, ideally, right? Sometimes you may get a little bit shorter than that, but usually four weeks you want to separate your live vaccines out. Um, that way, again, the body has time to react to one before it kind of moves on to the next thing. You re kind of re-challenge the immune system there, okay? But certainly there's not an interaction where if you got uh, inactivated today, he could, he could receive a live next week. Typically, you wouldn't really run into that situation clinically, but if it came up, you could do that. All right. Up next. Prior to starting treatment with alemtuzumab, MS patients should be tested for... Tuberculosis, strep pneumo, Lyme disease, or influenza A and B. One of those things you're like, I know this one <coughs> immediately. Good. Tuberculosis. Oh, wow. One on each of the other ones is interesting. Um, <laughs> yes, TB needs to be that thing you have to test for, right? Because again, what do you worry about? Activation of a latent infection, right? So you can be very careful with that. Um, that's an easily, like, one of those things, like, block box warning kind of thing, where if, like, you miss it and your patient got TB because you didn't check for it, like, Easy litigation, like, it's no problem. They, they, they'd be able to nail you to the wall pretty easy for that. So you want to check it out. And again, it's good for your patients. They don't get TB, right? Typically, yes. Um, strep pneumo, Lyme disease, A and B, flu. Uh, you don't have to worry about testing for those necessarily unless you had some other compelling indication to test for it. All right. Who would be contraindicated from receiving frovatriptan? History of ischemic stroke, psoriasis, hypertension controlled with HCTZ, or ergot use last week? And you're like, what the heck's frovatriptan? I already forgot. Yeah. Hmm. The triptan, but what's the triptan used for? So these cahoots are good because you have to change gears quite frequently, just like you do in the real world, right? Maybe seeing a patient coming in for hypertension, and then you're seeing someone for diabetes and someone for MS and someone for this condition. Interesting. Okay, so let's talk about it. So what is frovatriptan used for? Migraines. Good. Is it for, say, prophylaxis or acute treatment? Acute treatment of migraines. This is like Imitrex, right? Sumatriptan. This is like DHE or uh, um, dihydroergotin. These are for acute termination of migraines. So I call it abortive therapy because you're aborting in the escape pod button to get out of that migraine as fast as you can, right? Those are good for acute treatment. Um, what would be some examples of things for, um, say, for instance, prophylaxis of migraines? Like beta blockers, things like topiramate, things like calcium channel blockers. There's several options that are out there, right? Valproic acid could be used as well. Um, those are good for prophylaxing against a migraine from occurring in the first place, okay? So um, hypertension controlled with HCTZ. Why do you think hypertension could be a possible contraindication here? What do these drugs do to treat the migraine? Vasoconstrictive, right? How do they do that? Serotonin agonist, good. Which receptors? 5-HT1, B, and D. 
okay? So 5-HT1B and D agonists by agonizing those receptors that cause that cerebral vasoconstriction and helps to relieve that pressure, especially on things like the trigeminal nerve, and that helps to prevent that spread throughout the CNS causing a migraine to occur, okay? Um, so why do you think hypertension might be relatively contraindicated? Put the emphasis on the wrong syllable there, but how do, why do you think that would be the case? <coughs> Increase the blood pressure, absolutely. So if it's uncontrolled, they came in, their blood pressure is 180 over 100, might not be a good drug for them, right? Because it can cause it to go up higher. But it's controlled HCTZ, if they're relatively controlled, I'm not worried about that. Psoriasis is kind of just a random red herring there. How about ergot use last week? Why is that okay? Why? When would that not be okay? So then 12 hours, right? And again, what would be the risk if I gave both of those within a 12-hour period? Too much vasoconstriction, right? Because DHE is doing the same thing, causing vaso, uh, spas or vasoconstriction of the cerebral vessels, leading to possible ischemic stroke, hypertension, MI. Not great, right? And again, that's why ischemic stroke is the actual correct answer on there because you don't want to put them at risk for developing another ischemic stroke. That area of, say, um, occlusion and you cause vasoconstriction, that could worsen that and then lead to another stroke. So that would be a contraindication for them receiving provotriptan. You think it applies only to frovotriptan or all the triptans? All of them, good. And how about DHE? Uh huh. Yeah, because they're doing the same thing, right? Uh, what was the main difference between say DHE and say uh, the triptans? DHE usually lasts a little bit longer, but you're more likely to see things like chest pain and you know shortness of breath, things like that associated with a few more side effects. Um, who would I definitely never ever want to give DHE to? Pregnant woman, right? Category X. You never, never, ever want to give DHE to a pregnant woman. And again, who's more likely to come in for migraines? I think young females, or childbearing potential, potentially, right? So that's what you have to think about. Get a pregnancy test on them beforehand. All right. Which of the following is most likely to affect the QTC interval at therapeutic doses? I think it'd be buspirone, clonazepam, ketiapine, or sertraline. So Buspar, Clonopin, Seroquel, or Zoloft. <laughs> Not the ortho test code today, by the way. Okay, good, good. Still will be like totally depressed gearing up for this weekend, studying for my test. Good. Interesting. <laughs> All right. You know, don't look at it as I was wrong on that question. Look at it as a, this is a new opportunity for learning, right? <laughs> what did Dean Marquardt say about fail? It's the first attempt in learning, right? <laughs> Just don't let it turn into a lail. Otherwise, you're going to be really in trouble. Yeah, don't let it be the last attempt. Um, okay, so going into it. So think about things prolonging the QT. You want to think about your atypical antipsychotics, right? So any of those are going to be able to prolong the QT. Now, normally, is that a big problem in and of itself? If it prolongs it a few milliseconds, probably not a big deal. We worry about it, especially if you combine multiple meds that can do it. And if you have an overdose or something like that, that would be something of a pretty big concern. You know, what's a normal QTC, by the way? 0.44 typically is usually a little bit longer for females. When do I get started to get concerned? 0.5 and above is usually, when it's starting to get like 0.6, and I'm really, really concerned about things like torsades developing, right? But, so it's not, uh, so typing would be the, the correct answer in that case. I could have put risperidone, I could have put olanzapine, I could have put, um, what else, aripiprazole. Any of those can potentially prolong the QTC, so be aware of that. Um, buspirone, not known to do that. What do we use buspirone, uh, buspirone for? Anxiety, good. How about clonazepam? Anxiety, good. Which one of those would be good for like an acute anxiety attack? Clonopin's going to be a lot better for that. The benzos, you can tell by the PAM at the end of the name, a lot better for acute anxiety versus more chronic sort of management anxiety. Buspar is really good for chronic management. And the sertraline. So, okay, so sertraline is what kind of drug? SSRI. SSRI. Is it prolonging QT? Yeah. Not significantly, right? Which is, a, uh, <laughs> which is the SSRI? I put it specifically on my slides. The SSRIs that cause QT prolongation? Citalopram. Citalopram and? Escitalopram. I've seen a lot of overdoses of different SSRIs. I can tell you, I've never ever seen sertraline cause a prolonged QT. I can certainly tell you I've seen escitalopram cause this, right? Seizures is the other big thing you worry about with Lexapro and Celexa, okay? Now, is there maybe one case report of a person who had QT prolongation on sertraline? 
Maybe. So does it, does it get reported because of that? Absolutely. But it does not mean therapeutically it's going to occur. So please be aware of that. Why do we care about that at therapeutic doses? Well, what if I had someone who had depression on top of schizophrenia, and I had them on citalopram plus Seroquel? Start to see how these can start to add up. And let's say I need to put them on, you know, they're getting nauseous because they have some gastroenteritis. I put them on Zofran now. Zofran can prolong QT, as we'll learn about when we get into GI. You start to see how these things will stack up on, on top of each other, okay? So be aware of that. Again, if you learn something else on a different class, you study it for that class. But here, for my purposes, this is what I'm telling you. My lowly pharmacist perspective that that's what you're going to see, okay? Anyway. Inactivated vaccine cause which type of immunity? Vaccines. Innate, active, passive, or booster? <coughs> Very good. It's active immunity. Why is it active? My body's responding to it, generating its own immune response to it. Very good. Uh, what would be an example of passive immunity? Yeah, if I gave someone immune globulin, what's well, another case? Breast milk is a very good one. What's a, uh, uh, an example of innate immunity? Neutrophils, macrophages, your skin is kind of a nice innate barrier against disease, right? So good. Um, so good to know those differences there. Which one provides, um, between active and uh, passive, provides longer sort of uh, durability in their response? active for sure, right? Because again, it's a patient able to mount their own response. Okay. Which one's faster in onset? Passive, right? Because I can give someone the immune globulin right now and they're immediately protected from that. Okay. Huh? Uh, well, I mean, I ask similar questions, right? These are concepts, right? These are things that get your mind starting to, to take over and get that hamster back on the wheel after ortho and all right, he's, he's got his crutches and he's ready to get back on the wheel and go, right? They're thought-provoking. They encourage a discussion. Okay. Uh, which of the following would treat an acute anxiety attack most quickly? So I probably already gave this one away. Would it be alprazolam, desvinlafaxine, fluoxetine, or fuoxetine, I don't know what that is, uh, or buspirone? These questions are easier, but so far, if I think I had to get the average on here, I don't think it'd be worse than what the actual test will be. So, anyway, yes, alprazolam. So, alprazolam is what type of drug? The benzodiazepine. How does it work? I hear GABA. What does it do with GABA? If on rotation, your preceptor goes, How does a benzodiazepine work? And you're like, GABA? <laughs> Not... I'm sorry? Potentiates GABA. That's a, that's a way better answer, right? It potentiates the effects of GABA. How does it do that? <laughs> Never answer a question with a question. Huh? Right, so how does it potentiate the effects of GABA? So it binds to the benzodiazepine receptor site. So there's actually a BZD receptor site. And actually makes it so that the receptor is much more um, sort of readily able to interact with that GABA. So when GABA comes along, are we talking about GABA A or B receptors? GABA A, right? So specifically when we're talking about seizures and talking about anxiety, GABA A is, is what we're talking about. So it makes it easier for GABA to come along and bind to the receptor, allows it to open up, and then what flows through? Chloride flows in along the concentration gradient, and then what happens? The cells hyperpolarize. It cannot have an action potential as easily. You chill out, right? As opposed to something like the, the barbiturates, how did that differ in its mechanism? That one actually goes and opens up the channel itself, so it directly causes activation of the GABA A receptors. It will open them up and allow chloride to flow through, right? So that makes a difference because how do you think the side effect profile differs between, say, barbiturates versus benzodiazepines? Which one do you think is more sedating? The barbiturates, absolutely, because they can directly go and open those GABA channels to open up and allow that chloride to flow in. So they tend to be more sedating. You tend to see more things like hypotension, respiratory depression. On the other hand, benzos are very, very safe for the most part. Right? So the only way you can die from a benzo overdose is if you get hit with a truck delivering the benzos to you. 
because it's very safe. It doesn't cause a lot of respiratory depression with an oral overdose, right? That's kind of the nice thing about it. Very much wider therapeutic index, which is why you see more of it being used typically, okay? Now, desmethylaxine is what kind of drug? It's an SNRI, good, so it's going to be the cousin to venlafaxine, right? So again, those are very similar to SNRI, so it's going to have uh, their, their activity at both serotonin and norepinephrine. Uh, how about fluoxetine? Just straight SSRI. How about buspirone? It's kind of mixed, you know, it has some serotonin agonism, some antagonism, you know, so it had some different activities there, but again, working through serotonin to work to try to prevent uh, an anxiety attack. And again, these other three are used for more what? Yeah, they're used for depression, but they're also used for anxiety, right? Oftentimes, depression and anxiety go hand in hand. These are good for maintenance therapy, right? They're good for trying to prevent acute panic attacks and things like that. Now, which one of these, if you had an acute withdrawal from, could cause rebound anxiety? Fluoxetine, what else? Buspirone, what else? Does, yeah, all of them basically, right? All of them cause we rebound, rebound, uh, rebound anxiety. So you be really careful with that. Now, which one do you think would be most dangerous in withdrawal? The Xanax would be absolutely the most dangerous in withdrawal, right? Because your body gets used to having that extra GABA effect around. If I take that away, because I'm downregulating those receptors, you end up having too much excit excitation from things like glutamate, and that's when you can develop withdrawal seizures, and that's what's going to kill the patient, right? So again, I'm talking about opioids and how withdrawal from opioids is very uh, unpleasant, but not fatal. Certainly this can be, right? Just like alcohol, withdrawal can be fatal. Okay. <coughs> Moving on. Which of the following only work when HIV virus expresses a CCR5 receptor? Be Eltegravir, or Elvitegravir, Nelfinavir, Maraviroc, or Adizanavir? even split once there. But yes, Maraviroc is the CCR5 receptor antagonist. That one's unique in its mechanism. It's the only one that does that. Um, now, is that normally part of a kind of the key component of a heart regimen? Not typically. It's not every single virus is going to be expressing that. Not every person will express that forever or a uh, virus will express that forever. So it's usually going to be on a case by case basis. Normally, what needs to be that heart therapy? What's the, what's the backbone of that regimen? Two NRTIs, and then what else? Protease inhibitor, integrase inhibitor, or non-nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitor, an NNRTI, right? So again, any of those could be the, the third drug in that regimen. But you have to have two NRTIs, um, right? So be able to recognize which drugs fall into which categories. So like Elvitegravir is what? Integrase inhibitor, right? So be able to recognize those. Just because it has a VR on the end, you're not going to get you very far when it comes to HIV, right? You'd be like, I know it's for a virus, but I don't know which one falls into which category. You have to know the mechanisms, make sure that the regimens actually make sense. Okay. What is the drug of choice for acute dystonia after taking haloperidol? This is not Department of Corrections. Anyone, anyone watch Scrubs? You have a, you know, the Todd? Hit that DOC, yeah. That sounds very funny. I do remember that, yes. Very progressive first time. about it. So <laughs> someone gets acute dystonia after haloperidol. Why do they get that? What is haloperidol doing? Blocking D2 receptors, right? Remember, haloperidol is a typical or atypical antipsychotic? 
typical antipsychotic, right? So it blocks dopamine 2 receptors, and that usually leads to that seesaw effect, right? Where dopamine 2 activity goes down, what goes up? Acetylcholine activity. Remember, go back to Parkinson's because the actual opposite is actually happening here, right? Because, again, you're getting more, or actually this is the same thing as you're basically inducing Parkinson's on this patient. So acetylcholine activity goes up. That's why we see that tremor you see with Parkinson's patients, right? This is the same thing. That increase in acetylcholine interacts with what type of receptors to cause these acute dystonic reactions. Interact with the skeletal muscle, right? What kind of receptors are on the skeletal muscle cause activation? Acetylcholine, so these are muscarinic or nicotinic? Nicotinic, right? Because nicotinic receptors are on the neuromuscular junction. When you activate those, what happens? The muscle contracts, right? Think back to physiology all those many, many months ago, right? Talked about how neuromuscular transmission occurs. It says nicotinic receptors. So that kind of makes sense why if you're kind of causing acetylcholine activity to go up, that it would cause those muscles to, to contract up, okay? Because of that too much activity on the nicotinic receptors, okay? So what can I do to prevent that? And this is happening more centrally. I can give an anticholinergic to help fix that. Okay, it's going to be working centrally. There are some muscarinic receptors out there that's going to be involved with this as well, but by using anticholinergic, I can expect to reverse that effect. So this is where we use things like trihexyphenidyl. What else could I use? Benadryl. Benadryl. Diphenhydramine is probably the most common one you're going to go with. What else could I use? Benzodiazepine or cogentin is the other big one. Okay. Some patients might be on this kind of chronically while they're taking these typical antipsychotics to prevent these from occurring. Sometimes you're using it acutely. As I mentioned, that family that came in, they all thought they were taking diazepam, and they end up taking hal halperidol instead, right? So we give them diphenhydramine to reverse that effect, right? It relaxes that dystonia. So metoclopramide, we haven't really talked about that drug very much, but we use it as what kind of drug? It's an antiemetic, and we're going to talk about that in the GI section. It actually also causes D2 receptor blockade. So that would actually make the problem worse. So that would not be good. You guys just mostly go with like, I haven't heard of that drug before. That sounds good. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Um, how about olanzapine? Why would that not be right? It's an atypical antipsychotic. So it still has some dopamine 2 receptor blockades. That actually would make the problem worse. But what's kind of the nice thing about olanzapine versus something like haloperidol in general? Typically, your atypicals do not cause dystonic reactions, okay? Because what are they doing instead of blocking dopamine mainly? Block serotonin, right? 5-HT2 receptors that are blocking there. That's why they work for both the positive and the negative symptoms of schizophrenia versus haloperidol mainly works on the positive symptoms. And they're coming in, they're hallucinating, and they're trying to fight the cops and all this kind of stuff, and you need to really take them down. Haloperidol is going to do that. You should give them 5 of halidol and 2 of ativan, <laughs> called the B-52, that's going to knock them out like a bomb, right? So it's a very handy combination. You still might see it used occasionally. And then flufenazine is also another typical antipsychotic. It has a very high dopamine receptor blockade, very high potency, just like uh, haloperidol. So that's actually also very likely to cause <coughs> acute dystonic reactions. Okay. All right. Don't look so demoralized. You guys have lots of time to study. Okay. Uh, which medication route is least preferred during an acute seizure? I think rectal, intramuscular, intravascular, or oral. <laughs> Very good. Why not oral? They're actively seizing, right? They're not protecting their airway potentially. They may aspirate. They may not actually be able to swallow very effectively. Not a great route, right? Um, rectal, though, very commonly done for a good long time, right? They had the uh, the diastase, the rectal uh, diazepam gel that you could inject into the patient's rectum. Again, it came with like a, um, there's a special uh, applicator have basically, again, you know, education is really important because we'd have people who have kids that would get basically their first diagnosis of the seizure in the ER. We'd give them a prescription for diastat. Had to educate them on how to use it because things like, you know, making sure that you put the lubricant on before you stick it in the rectum. If you're in the heat of the moment, your kid's seizing, you may not think to stop and be like, oh, wait a second, this actually can cause some rectal trauma. Like, you get to think about those sort of things. And by educating beforehand, they would be like, oh, yeah, i got to put the, the lube on there first. That way it's going to be a little bit easier. It's not going to cause any damage. From that standpoint, right? You want to cause one problem by treating another problem. Okay, education is very important. Uh, intramuscular, great route if we can have that available. Intravascular, even better. 
sometimes hard to get though when the patient's having a seizure and they're moving around on you. It can be very difficult. What's another route we could have used? Intranasal, which is now becoming much more common, um, mainly because we have a, easy access to atomizing devices, which cause a nice fine mist of the um, of the drug. We use midazolam most commonly. Midazolam is what kind of drug? It's a benzodiazepine, right? So benzodiazepines are very good for seizure treatment. So like I said, diazepam was used. Midazolam is another common one used for intranasal administration nowadays. That's what mostly our neurologists are recommending, because again, it's easier than having to take off their pants and do all this kind of stuff. You can just kind of give them a shot, squirt up the nose, and it works just as well. Okay. What's the benefit of using intranasal route versus setting an oral route? You know, aspiration, but what about just from the, the kinetic standpoint? Fast absorption, right? Because the nasal mucosa is very highly vascularized. What else? What do you bypass? First pass effect, right? So bioavailability goes up even higher because uh, you're not hitting the lever the first round. Okay, very good. I wonder, is this the three same people that were the three dissenters on that last question? These are things I'd like to know. Okay, which patient would produce the best response to an inactivated vaccine? A 26-year-old male with HIV slash AIDS, 16-year-old female, 6-year-old male under active treatment for leukemia, or a 14-day-old infant with no medical problems? This one is pretty easy. It's probably too easy. I would never put this on my test. <laughs> I just reviewed your, your gyne exam. We made some very good, or the OB, whatever one you're taking next. I just reviewed that, making some very good changes there too. <laughs> really good test now. Anyway, yeah, uh, so the 16 year old female seems pretty obvious, right? Because, like, again, no comorbid conditions, they have a good response. Why would it not be the 14 day old infant? Their immune system isn't really that confident yet. And in fact, I could have actually, what I should have put on there is probably uh, a, a live attenuated vaccine. That probably would have been better to make sure that, especially that patient would be contraindicated from that because you worry about things like what in, the, in that young of patient? Maternal antibodies going through and inactivating the vaccine, you wouldn't get a very good response. That's why you have to wait till they are 12 months before you get the MMR uh, vaccine, which is a, is a live attenuated. So things like that. And again, the other two, the HIV AIDS patient and the active leukemia treatment, they're immunosuppressed, right? So they're not going to be able to mount a very good response to that. So again, someone know the conditions, seems pretty obvious that would be the, the right one. But again, know why those other three are not correct in this case. All right. Which of the following medications would be best suited for migraine prophylaxis? So we talked about this already. Would be sumatriptan, which I spelled that wrong again, uh, oxycodone and acetaminophen, propranolol, or dihydroergotamine? Very good. Right. So some, some of you obviously remembered what I said earlier. Fantastic. Good short-term recall. Um, so why is oxycodone and acetaminophen not a good option? We haven't talked about opioids too much. We'll talk about that later, I think, in the next section. Would be good for prophylaxis. It would be good for acute treatment. Certainly it can treat a migraine, but it's kind of like using a sledgehammer to get a little tiny nail, right? So it's going to be kind of overkill in a lot of cases. Um, sumatriptan and dihydroergotamine are used for what? acute treatment of the migraines, right? Not good for prophylaxis. You wouldn't want to use this all the time anyway, because what would you see? Hypertension, chest pain, like you wouldn't want to use that all the time. There's a lot of side effects associated there. However, propranolol is a very good option, but you say, wait a second, that's counterintuitive. Causing that vasodilation, as well as causing migraine anyway, can't propranolol cause a migraine? And you would say, absolutely. So how would you mitigate that? Start low and go slow, right? So just like you would say, for instance, start a beta blocker on a CHF patient, right? That can be very deleterious to a CHF patient, but we know they need to be on one. You start at a very low dose, you titrate and see how they're responding to it, right? Uh, you know, if they get too bad of a migraine, slow down the, go back down to the dose and titrate up even slower next time. Um, that could be a good option. Who might not, that, who might propranolol be bad in? Asthmatic patient, who else? 
The elderly are not a very good option for propranolol because it's very fat soluble, so it's going to cause things like uh, nightmares, hallucinations, not great in the elderly. Um, what else could I have seen on this? What else would have been a good answer here for migraine prophylaxis? Topamax or topiramate would have been a good option. What else? Valproic acid would have been a good option here. We could have done like uh, nifedipine or nimodipine, the calcium channel blocker, dihydropyridine would have been good here. Lots of different options, right? Um, you know, if the issue was they were having like really tense neck muscles, what could I do? Hmm? Uh, I don't even know what those are, but sure, maybe you can try that. Um, Drug-wise, though, what could you use drug-wise? Botox, right? Sometimes you can actually use Botox to relax some of those muscles and prevent those migraines. So again, there's different therapies that are out there. Um, good. All right, moving on. All right. Uh, which of the following antiepileptics can cause pancreatitis and hepatotoxicity? Pretty well known for this. Is it clobazam? Is it valproic acid, benztropine, or lorazepam? Very good. You guys just knew that? You're just like, got this. A pro cast, obviously. Or is it a process of elimination? You just knew it. I'm going to go with that one. Let's go with that. Um, what kind of drug is clobazam? It's a benzo. Yeah, it's a newer benzo we end up using for seizures uh, sometimes in kids. Um, the rizopam is a benzo. Typically, uh, they do not have a lot of hepatotoxicity associated with them. Some of the benzos will be uh, hepatically metabolized, but they typically don't cause hepatic injury in and of themselves. Benzotropine, also not known to do that, but valproic acid, absolutely. We definitely know it's hepatotoxic, can cause pancreatitis. In fact, if you have a patient who's coming in for pancreatitis that doesn't really have a lot of other obvious sort of reasons for it, check to see their, if on their med list they have valproic acid. It's a very commonly missed thing you might consider. What else can you see with valproic acid, maybe due to a carnitine deficiency? Hmm? Mm, I don't know if that happens or not, maybe. What else can you see due to the carnitine deficiency? Hyperammonemia, right? So again, if they're coming in with altered mental status but at a normal valproic acid level, could be due to the hyperammonemia, right? It's a good catch if you can find a patient like that. Okay. Oh, actually, I had a case, I don't know if I mentioned it or not, but it was a, I don't remember if it was male or female, but they had overdosed. Actually, no, they were found. I remember the case now. So uh, it was a person who was found um, acting altered in a convenience store parking lot. They were brought in, they were completely incoherent, they were not able to uh, give any kind of history. All they found was a vial of some sort of unknown stuff, track marks on the patient. They're trying to figure out what the heck's going on. Eventually she became kind of belligerent, they're having to give her some Ativan to try to calm her down. They're trying to see like, what the heck is this? So I did a bunch of labs and everything was coming back pretty much normal, but they did pneumonia because we know that uh, hyperammonemia can cause altered mental status and that actually ended up being high. And so they're like, oh, why in the heck is this ammonia high? The LFTs are fine. What in the heck is going on here? What, what could be causing this? And so, you know, they, that was one of those things where they, they're trying to figure out what to do with the patient, what kind of interventions they need to do. And I said, well, wait a second. Well, you know, we can't get any history. They're still considered John or Jane Doe, so we had no information on them. I was like, you might want to check considering getting a what level? A valproic acid. Well, they already got the ammonia, so they knew it was high. I said, get a valproic acid level. Because someone's having ultra mental status, or out in the middle of a convenience store parking lot, getting picked up by, by you know, the police or whatever, and like, and I was like, maybe they have bipolar disorder. Like, maybe they're on a mood stabilizer because they have some associated mental health conditions. We know that you know substance abuse goes hand in hand with bipolar disorder in a lot of cases. Um, so I actually never got called back. I'm not sure if that was high or not. But um, again, use those kind of things to start thinking step by step. Well, maybe say maybe this is what's causing it because this could be in her history that we can't get. And a lot of times you have those kind of patients where just there's no history available, and you kind of have to go off your best guesses or your hunches. Anywho, um, all right, so let's move on. Neurosyphilis would be most appropriately treated with which medication? Azithromycin, benzathine penicillin G, aqueous penicillin G, or ceftriaxone? What do we think? Does neurosyphilis sound bad or good? Sounds real bad, right? Worse than regular syphilis.
<laughs> so tripped you up a little bit. So let's look through it. So this is, again, going into like, how do we decide what drugs we're going to use for this patient? So most of you knew, actually all of you knew, that penicillin is a treatment of choice for syphilis, right? The question is, well, how invasive is it? How serious of a case do we have here? So benzathine penicillin G, what was the benefit of that drug? IMs, one dose, long acting. Remember, what, what do we like about STD treatment? What is this, uh, the things we're looking for in our drug regimens? One and done, right? We want a one time dose. So we have insured compliance as we gave it to them that we know they got it, right? So that's one thing, right? So again, to come with just an uncomplicated case of syphilis. When it gets more invasive or it gets to be disseminated like this, when you develop neurosyphilis, you need to make sure you're kind of getting them with much bigger guns here. So we're going to be using uh, high dose continuous IV penicillin, right? Because again, they're going to be admitted, they're going to be in the ICU for a while, so they're going to be getting the IV penicillin. So benzathine penicillin could probably still be effective, but it's not going to be recommended in that case. Because again, it doesn't really meet our clinical sort of situation there. By using the IV penicillin, you're going to get much better levels, much more likely to treat that neurosyphilis. Does that make sense? Okay. A little bit of a trick question, but again, most of you guys have got the point. You think syphilis, you think penicillin, right? Good. All right. Uh, patients being started on paroxetine for uh, major depressive disorder should avoid which herbal supplement? Melatonin, ginkgo, St. John's wort, or valerian root? So it should be like slam dunk. Hmm? And if you forgot, perhaps you need some of some ginkgo. Thank you. Yes, I think John's wart. Do not want to mix these two together. <laughs> There's some questions you're just like, everyone's got to get this right. Like, you got to know this, right? Because um, what's the problem with a lot of these herbal supplements? Are patients very forthright when they, unless you ask about them very specifically, you might not be able to get that history from them, right? They're not going to come and be like, oh, actually, I take creatine, and I take uh, ginkgo for this, and I take melatonin for that. Um, you got to be really careful with these, these herbal supplements. Because, again, I may think, oh, they're just herbals. They don't do anything. They're, they're very powerful medication, just like anything else. And are they under very good scrutiny from the FDA? Nope. So almost no scrutiny, right? Unless they think there's an actual safety issue with the herbal supplement. They don't have to do anything with it, right? So it's, it's a little bit uh, less well-regulated than your normal prescription drug products. You have to be careful. So why do I want to uh, be stressing to the patient not to take St. John's Wort along with their paroxetine? Risk for serotonin syndrome or serotonin toxicity, right? Why? St. John's Wort is doing what? Blocking monoamine oxidase there you go perfect so mono, so it's kind of working like a phenylzine or uh, tranylcypramine or something like that where it's blocking monoamine oxidase so it's not having the same exact action as paroxetine which paroxetine is what kind of drug SSRI. ssri right but again they're working synergistically and that's where you see that serotonergic toxicity okay that's where you gotta be careful uh between those two there okay uh, also what else can st john's ward do sip inducer which one 3A4, right? So it's going to drive down levels of a lot of other drugs. Also induces PGP. That can also be a problem as well, right? Again, PGP is that efflux pump, so it also will drive down levels of susceptible drugs. Okay. Very good. How would you adjust the how would you adjust the dose of rosuvastatin for a patient taking ritonavir? Would I use the same dose, increase the dose, stop the drug, or decrease the dose? Hmm? Mm -hmm. Um, Eloquist, I have to double check. I think it's less severe interaction. Certainly, like estrogen, you see some increased metabolism. Okay, if you think about it. What do you think? You're actually having to make a decision. What do I do with the dose? Do I go up? Do I go down? Do I stay the same? To stop it all together? Interesting. So let's look at this. So why would combining a statin plus ritonavir be a problem? What does ritonavir do? What kind of drug is ritonavir? It's an antiviral. Fantastic. We're step one. 
What's the next step? What type of antiviral? What type of virus does it work against? It's a protease inhibitor for HIV. Fantastic. So we're a protease inhibitor. Okay, so what does it do from a pharmacokinetic standpoint? It inhibits a protease enzyme. What else does it inhibit? Not 2C9. Remember, this is the big one because we don't use ritonavir by itself as a protease inhibitor. We add it to other protease inhibitors to do what? It boosts their levels. We use it as a booster because it inhibits CYP3A4. What other drug from HIV did that? There's a cobicostat. That was the other one, right? So by inhibiting 3A4, you boost levels of your other protease inhibitors. You have to take the drug less often, right? Pill burn used to be a really big issue with a lot of HIV medication regimens. Nowadays, it's gotten down to where sometimes they just take one pill a day. It's awesome. But looking at this, so you say, okay, well, why would a patient on ritonavir even need to be on a statin in the first place? Remember, protease inhibitors cause a lot of metabolic derangements, right? You see hyperlipidemia, you see hyperglycemia. So these patients are living for longer, but now they have a lot of metabolic complications, sometimes from the medications that could be exacerbating that, right? What else do protease inhibitors cause? Kind of like a unique sort of physical feature. Called the buffalo hump, right? That lipodystrophy is the other big thing you saw with that. Okay. So anyway, so it's a CYP3A4 inhibitor. So would it be a problem with resufistatin? It would not, right? Because remember, resufistatin was nice because it was not mediated through CYP, uh, metabolism was not going through CYP3A4. It was a very safe medication to use with things uh, that would inhibit CYP3A4. So I could use it with something like, uh, I don't know, what's a good CYP3A4 inhibitor? Grapefruit juice. It wouldn't have no interaction with grapefruit juice, right? I could do, use it with verapamil. I could use it with diltiazem. No problems there. That was a benefit. Now, which sip, uh, which uh, statins could I put there that would say you'd want to decrease your dose? Simvastatin's a good one. Atorvastatin's the other big one, right? Because you think about your most potent statins, what are the two most potent ones? Resuvastatin and atorvastatin. So if I had to make a choice, I had a patient with HIV who was worried about hyperlipidemia, I'd probably want to have, have them on uh, resuvastatin rather than atorvastatin because it mitigates that reaction. You're not going to see any level changes there. I don't have to worry about adotoxicity. You don't have to worry about rhabdo, any of that stuff. Make sense? In this case, I would leave the dose alone. Got it? All right. Okay. Uh, which drug would finish the HIV regimen? I have zidavidine and tricytamine. What would be a good third drug on this regimen? Would it be abacavir, raltegravir, lopinavir, ritonavir, or etravirine? Yes. Mm, I had to double check that one. I'm not sure. To look it up. You can look it up too. That one might be 2C9, I think. Maybe. Double check me though. There were three correct answers, so good job <laughs> to all the ten of you. But um, so, rotegravir is what type of drug? Integrase inhibitor, right? So, an integrase inhibitor could finish off that regimen because the first two are what? NRTIs, right? Those are NRTIs. So, zidavidine and tricytamine could have put tenofovir there. There's a lot of different um, ones I could put there. Uh, lopinavir, ritonavir, what is that? Those are. Protease inhibitors, that is an acceptable third regimen, or third drug you'd add onto that regimen, right? So third and fourth drug, uh, so to speak. And then etrovirine is what type of drug? And in RTI. Now, what, now according to AIDSinfo.gov, what's kind of the, the top recommended one or class of drug to use? Integrase inhibitors have kind of been coming like the, the kind of the top dog from that regimen. But you'll still see patients based off of their genotypic reporting and based off the phenotyping and all that, you may find they may need to uh, switch over to one of these other ones based off resistance. Now, back of here is incorrect because why? It's another NRTI. So adding that as a third NRTI to the regimen would not make uh, a very good heart regimen. It would not be as effective as if I had one of these other ones on here. Okay, it would not be recommended. Anyone remember anything specific about a back of here that was kind of unique? Look that up. That's really important. Should I tell you what it is? It's the HLA testing, right? You have to make sure you're checking for that pharmacogenetic factor for them before you start it, because otherwise you're going to develop anaphylaxis if you have it. You have to be really careful with the back of here. Okay. 
it's like HLA, some specific mutation, but they have that, then they cannot receive a back of ear because they will anaphylax. Okay. Which of the following meds carries the biggest risk for a rash and Stevens-Johnson syndrome? Phenytoin, fluoxetine, trazodone, or levetiracetam? You know, wait a second, the one that I thought about is not there. Boy. It's almost like there are a lot more drugs than just that that can cause Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Weird. Very good. Phenytoin, yes. Phenytoin definitely carries that risk. What's another big risk? Say, for instance, I extravasate phenytoin. The, yeah, the, the purple glove syndrome, right? So, again, you extravasate, causes a ton of tissue necrosis. They've lost limbs before because of that. So, if you're really careful, you're using a deep, secure vein before you start pushing phenytoin. It's so actually a limited rate you can push it at because it can cause a lot of issues. Um, so, yes, that's definitely a risk there. Now, what were you probably thinking of as being the correct answer here? Lamotrigine, right? Lamictal is the other big one. Like, definitely have to warn patients if you see any new rashes, any blisters, any bullae, uh, any sloughing of skin, anything like that. You need to go to the ER. Stop taking the drug immediately, right? Uh, because that risk is pretty high there. But there's a lot of other uh, anti-epileptics, which you can look up, that also cause this as well. Carbamazepine could have been on this list, oxarbazepine potentially. There's a lot of them out there. Keppra is actually very well tolerated. In fact, it probably has the least amount of side effects out of the whole of the anti-epileptics, which is why a lot of neurologists are trying to use this first line now, at least for the pediatric patients I see. A lot of patients on, on Keppra there. Uh, Trazodone is used for what? Kind of a mixed serotonergic agent, SSRI with some some serotonin antagonism. What's it used for? Yeah, not depression so much anymore, but certainly for sleep. I've seen that a lot. What's a unique side effect of it? Priapism. Why? Alpha one. Antagonism, right? Alpha one antagonist. So that also would lead you to think, what other side effect could you see from alpha one antagonism? Hypotension, right? So you see hypotension, priapism is a possible risk there, but that's unique to trazodone, right? So think about that when you think trazodone, okay? All right. Uh, patient with ADHD and substance abuse issues would benefit most from which of the following? Bupropion, adamoxetine, mixed amphetamine salts, or dexmethylphenidate? Remember, we're dealing a lot more adult ADHD nowadays, so you might run into those patients. Not usually your six-year-olds that have substance abuse issues, but certainly your 26-year-olds might. Very good, adamoxetine. So, um, obviously, what's the issue with mixed amphetamines, Adderall and, and Focalin? They're both amphetamines, which means what? Risk for abuse and addiction, right? Because what class are they under? Two, right? They have the highest abuse potential out of there, right? Because we know they're addictive because they help to stimulate that dopamine release. You get those dopamine squirts from it, right? They're highly addictive, right? Just like crystal meth can be addictive, these can be addictive too, if used inappropriately. So not a good option if they have a history of substance abuse because they may be more prone to abusing that substance. Uh, bupropion would not do it because what do you normally use bupropion for? Smoking sedation, uh, cessation, not smoking sedation, smoking <laughs> cessation. <laughs> if you smoke, maybe you get sedated, but um, what else? Yeah, so it really depression and anxiety, right, is good, good for that. How does it differentiate itself from other depression meds? mainly blocked by uh, re uh, blocked reuptake of dopamine. Again, that's why you can use it for a lot of these addiction disorders like smoking or, say, um, you know, overeating disorders, things like that, because it helps to dysregulate or re kind of reestablish normal function of that dopamine pathway. Um, but it, it itself is not addictive, but plus it would not be used for ADHD either, so that would not be correct. Adamoxetine, though, what schedule is that? 
it's not scheduled actually. It's uh, why it's a good option for someone with substance abuse history. Uh, it's a non-scheduled medication. How does it work? Wow, so amazing. It's almost like you had it on the tip of your tongue there. <laughs> yeah, weird. Um, yeah, so it, it works more like an SNRI, so it's decent for ADHD. Probably not as effective as the amphetamines, but it can still be used and good for that sort of case there. Okay. Their last question, which of the following anti-epileptics anti work by facilitating increased GABA activity? Uh, what? Oh, that's weird. What is this? <laughs> Okay, so the top one's carbamazepine, the next one's lamotrigine, the next one's phenobarb, and then phenytoin. That is bizarre. <laughs> it's like we went to like Netscape or something. Like. <laughs> so carbamazepine's a triangle, the diamond's lamotrigine, the circle's phenobarb, and the square's phenytoin, I think, maybe? That's what it looks like. Can't tell who's responded. Oh, I see it there. This reminds me of my Angel Fire website back in the day. <laughs> yeah. Weird. This is bizarre. Okay, so it should have been. What should have the answer been? Phenobarb. Yeah, phenobarb helps to facilitate GABA. Uh, phenytoin works as what? Sodium channel blocker, right? Lamotrigine is doing what? Sodium channel blocker was the fourth answer. Carbamazepine also. Sodium channel blocker, right? So go back to your mechanisms and other differences there. So especially if you had to mix and match different drugs together, you don't want to use the same mechanisms. You want to be able to use something complementary. So phenytone plus phenobarb makes more sense than doing phenobarb plus, say, a benzo or, say, carbamazepine plus phenytone. Okay. Very good. Um, I don't know where the next button is. I'm so confused. <laughs> I'd like to know who the winner was. Oh, that looks like it's Nick. Let's. Oh no, this might have borked the whole thing. Oh no. <laughs> wah, wah. Let's say you're all winners in my book, <laughs> and you all get the free answer. Any guesses? B. It was B. <laughs> yeah, just reload the whole thing. Good thing I recorded it all, so that's okay. Uh, let me check the sticky board real quick, see what questions we have here. Okay, looks like I got two. Uh, in your PowerPoint, you say 24 hours for ergot and tryptans, but you just stated 12 hours. What's the deal with that, buddy? Uh, up to date, <laughs> also says 24 hours. Are you trying Jedi mind tricks? Mm, no, 24 hours is probably safer overall, right? Um, I've seen some people get away with 12 hours, but if my slides say 24 hours, go with that. And if I put 12 hours as the right answer on the test, you can come back and be like, your slides say this, and I'll, I'll give you a gift back. But um, yeah, 24 hours is certainly safer, so just go with that, okay? But, you know, push comes to stuff, I've seen some people, because if they come to the ER, they're there for something, it's been 12 hours, like, you probably push it, especially if their blood pressure looks good and they have no comorbid conditions, they're probably fine, okay? Um, let's see. In the review, you said it was contraindicated to take Frova and Ergot within 12 hours, but you should, okay, so let's see. I'm going to lump those together. <laughs> let's see what else. Uh, is your favorite color green? Uh, no, it's actually blue. Uh, why would eating uh, Why wouldn't eating tryptophan affect MAOIs in addition to tyramine since it is also a precursor to serotonin? That's a good question. Uh, I don't know. It just doesn't seem to be much of a clinical issue. The tryptophan, I'd have to look at the biochemical synthesis of it as it gets turned into the serotonin, but um, clinically it's not a big issue. You can have turkey with your... Your Nardil, no problem, right? Um, now, again, clinically, how often are we using MAOIs? Almost never, right? Maybe for Parkinson's patients, right? We talked about selegiline or risagiline. That gets used with some regularity for those patients. Um, and then what other drugs can cause monoamine oxidase inhibition? The patient might be on. Or Zyvot. That was a kind of a big one that a lot of people don't think about. If you had an MRSA infection or VRSA, Zyvox does that as well. So that may be something you want to um, watch out for for the interaction there. Uh, let's see. I think that's all the questions. Very good. Um, do you guys mind if I take just like two minutes to tell you about the, the case yesterday? Because I felt like I was kind of, um, my stuff is usually at the end, so I usually don't have like as much time to, to go because we're trying to cycle the groups out. Um, so the big thing is that with fluids, right? So when you're given fluids, if you're the ER practitioner, what are you normally going to be administering? Normal saline. Like you can't really go wrong with normal saline for most patients. It's good because it helps to fill up the intravascular space. How much do I use? 
we'll talk about it more when we get into the, the renal section and talk more about fluids there, but how much? At least a liter, right? For the most part. There's a specific dose for peds, which I've kind of covered before, 20 mLs per kilo, but a liter for most adults, you can't usually go wrong with it. Now, if they're a renal patient or they had CHF and they're already very edematous, how much would I give? Half, do 500 mLs, right? So you can get away with that, and that's usually not going to be a problem there. Um, now, again, when you're giving isotonic fluids like normal saline, it's going to stay right there in the intravascular space. So it's good to help you know, kind of get their blood pressure back up, get, get the heart rate back down. Um, but again, if they're still intracellularly depleted, they've been vomiting for a couple of days, what do I need to give them at that point? I can use something that's hypotonic. That's where my half normal saline, their NPO, so I'm giving them D5, and you add some, you know, some potassium into that. Okay, That's where that can be used to help kind of replete um, the cells because it's hypotonic, so it's going to go into the cells there, right? Now, one of the big problems you run into with using half normal saline, and actually we've moved a lot away from this, is that we cause a lot of iatrogenic hyponatremia that way. Okay, So if you think about it, normal saline has how much sodium in it per liter? Anyone know? 0.9%. What does that mean? So it's 0.9 grams per 100 mLs or 9 grams per 1,000 mLs for sure. But to convert that into something that's a little bit more usable, what's a normal serum sodium? 135 to 145, right? Well, a normal saline has, and to make it isotonic, because the normal blood tonicity is about what? Between 280 and 300 milliosms per liter, okay? So that's normal blood tonicity. So we want to get fluids that are very close to that. Well, when you have 0.9% sodium chloride, what is contributing to that tonicity? Sodium is contributing and the chloride is contributing. So to get to about 300, we use 154 milliequivalents of sodium and 154 of chloride, right? Make sense so far? So if I administer that, chances are I'm probably not going to send their sodium too far off the, the line. It may increase it a little bit after a long period of time. For the most part, it shouldn't really change it so much. Now, if I was getting half normal saline, how much sodium is in that at that point? We say half of 154, which is? 77, right? So you're giving 77 milliequivalents of sodium per liter. Now, if I start to infuse that into a patient, what's that going to do to the serum sodium? It's going to go down, right? Because I'm going to start to dilute out the sodium that's in the blood. So what you end up seeing is that we cause a lot of iatrogenic, which means we did it to the patient, hyponatremia, which can be problematic. Most patients are probably not going to be a big deal, but you don't want to cause more problems than what they came in with. So for the most part, we're actually been moving away, at least in pediatrics, uh, from using half normal D5 with 20K. Now, a lot of times we're just using normal saline. Eventually, some of it will get out to the intracellular space. That's not a problem. It'll eventually we'll partition out there. Um, and that's, that's good because we're not going to drop their sodium too low. Okay, that's, that's one of the big things to note there. Um, we'll talk more about opioids later on. We get into all of that in the pain management section, so don't fret about that too much. We'll get into talking about Dilaudid and morphine and all that kind of good stuff. Um, any other questions about the antibiotics? It's pretty straightforward. Second generation cephalosporin for uncomplicated appendicitis. Um, if you need to cover for say they have an abscess or they perfed or something like that, that's when you need to broad spectrum it to include pseudomonas. That's where exosin like, comes into play. It's a very good coverage for that. Uh, I think that was it. Any other questions from the meds? Oh, the other thing, Toradol. So I kind of caught a couple of you thinking about, well, you got to treat the patient's pain. What would be a problem with giving Toradol to a patient who might be going to surgery soon? Could be the bleeding risk, right? You think about that. Now, most patients, when they come into the ER, do you already have an idea of what they have going on? You may know they're coming in with abdominal pain, but you may not have your diagnosis. So oftentimes you're writing for meds before you know specifically what they have or what their eventual course is going to be. So do most patients probably end up getting some Toradol before going to surgery anyway? Probably, right? And so again, most of the time it's not going to be a big deal. They get a single dose, not a huge problem, right? Because again, the drug may be lasting six, eight hours. It's out of the system, you know, relatively quick. You don't see a ton of bleeding risk. So it's a consideration. But also if you think about what type of surgery are they getting? Are they just getting a laparoscopic procedure? They basically have just kind of three holes punched into them? Not a lot of bleeding risk with that versus they're completely opening them up, higher bleeding risk. So it's all kind of looking at the pros and cons, weighing the risk versus the benefits there. And typically most patients probably have gotten a dose of Toradol, probably not going to make a big deal. But I at least want you thinking about it, thinking about those risks to make sure you're making a good decision for your patient, right? Any other questions I can answer for you guys? You got your work cut out for you studying this weekend? If you have any questions, I will try to answer things through Sunday. Again, I probably go to bed around 10 or 11 Sunday night, maybe 12 if I'm getting a little wild. Um, <laughs> but beyond that, I would not expect to get any answers from emails. So if not, I will see you guys later.